Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. The topic of this video was actually suggested to me by a patron, thanks to John Paul George for the suggestion. And so it's time to take a dive into the sick story of the Cheshire home invasion murders. To set the scene, let's go back to 2007 and take a look at the idyllic life of the Pettit family. Dr William Pettit was an endocrinologist and medical director at the Jocelyn Diabetes Centre. His wife, Jennifer Hawke Pettit, a nurse and co-director of a health centre at a private boarding school. They had two children together, 17-year-old Haley and 11-year-old Michaela. Both girls attended private schools. They were hard-working and well-behaved. The family lived in a large, attractive house in a well-to-do neighbourhood in Cheshire, Connecticut. They were well-liked in their community and they attended services at the local Methodist church. Compare this to the lives of Stephen Hayes and Joshua Komazarzewski, two drug addicts that had spent a lot of their adult lives in and out of jail. The two had met at the halfway house after getting out of jail. 44-year-old Stephen Hayes was a crack addict that liked to break into people's cars to fund his habit. 29-year-old Joshua Komazarzewski had been breaking into people's houses since he was a teenager. He didn't even do it to steal stuff. Sometimes he just stood over the sleeping occupants, listening to them breathing. Then he would move stuff around in their house to freak them out when they woke up later. As he grew older, he became addicted to crystal meth, and he used his housebreaking skills to make money to buy his drugs. After meeting at the halfway house, they quickly became friends. Commissar Jeffsky told Hayes how lucrative the housebreaking could be, and they talked about burgling a house together. After leaving the halfway house, Hayes says that he tried to find legit work, but he was unable. Finding himself destitute, he lapsed back into using crack cocaine. In desperation, he contacted Commissar Jeffsky, and the two of them planned to make some easy money. Supposedly, the home invasion incident was supposed to be a simple break-in and cash grab. They would enter the home of some rich family, threaten them a bit and take whatever money was in the house. Joshua Commissar Jeffsky's actions before the event paint a different picture. He'd spotted Jennifer and Michaela Pettit at the local stop and shop. Michaela avidly watched the food networks and loved to cook meals for her family. They were shopping for ingredients for that night's meal. Joshua took a particular sordid interest in the 11 year old girl and followed Jennifer and Michaela all the way back to their home. When he saw how nice the Pettit residence was, and probably seeing an opportunity to fulfil his sick fantasies about Michaela, Commissar Jeffsky contacted Stephen Hayes and proposed that they break into the Pettit residence that very night. Hayes, suffering from crack withdrawal and eager to find his next fix, readily agreed and the two men made their plans. At 7.45, Hayes sends a text to Commissar Jeffsky which read, I'm chomping at the bit to get started, need a margarita soon. An hour later, Hayes texts again, We still on, he says. Commissar Jeffsky replied with, I'm putting the kids to bed, hold your horses. Dude, the horses want to get loose, lol, was Hayes' response. Meanwhile in the petted home, the family had just finished the pasta dish that Michaela had made for them and they all settled down together to watch a movie. Around 11pm the family retired to bed. Haley went into her own room. William had fallen asleep on the couch in the sunroom, so Michaela got into bed next to her mother so they could read some Harry Potter together. And so like this, the household lapsed into a sleepy Sunday night silence. That is until around 3am, when Stephen Hayes and Joshua Komazarzewski arrived at the Pettit residence. They had with them a knife, a pellet gun which resembled a 9mm pistol, and a bag of zip ties. They found the bulkhead door to the basement unlocked, so they quietly slipped into the cellar. 
Leaning against the cellar stairs, they found a Louisville Slugger baseball bat which they picked up and took with them as they climbed up into the interior of the house. Finding William Pettit still asleep on the sunroom couch, they beat him repeatedly over the head with the baseball bat, brutally splitting his scalp open. They pointed the fake gun at him, bound his wrists and ankles with the zip ties, and told him that they only wanted money. The intruders then made their way upstairs into Jennifer's bedroom. Michaela was still asleep on the bed next to her mother. Again, the two men stated that they only wanted money. Jennifer was tied to the bedposts by her ankles and wrists. Then Michaela was dragged into her bedroom and restrained in the same way. Haley was tied to her bed in the same manner. A pillowcase was placed over each of their heads. The two men searched the house for money, but they found very little, so they returned to William and demanded to know where the safe was hidden. Dr. Pettit told them that there was no safe. They untied his ankles and marched him downstairs into the basement. They then bound him to a support pole with zip ties and threw a blanket over his head. Dr. Pettit was on blood thinning medication and he was losing a lot of blood from the wound on his forehead. He started lapsing in and out of consciousness as the two men went back upstairs and further ransacked the house looking for money. During their search they found Jennifer's checkbook register. It indicated that she had about $30,000 in the bank. They were unsatisfied with the money that they'd found so far, so the two men changed their plans. Now they would wait until the bank opened, then force Jennifer to withdraw money for them. What sort of torments and intimidations they subjected the family to in those intervening hours is unknown, but during that time, in an attempt to save her family, Jennifer made multiple attempts to become friendly with the intruders, even offering to cook breakfast for them. Later that morning, Stephen Hayes left the house and drove to a gas station to purchase two cans of gasoline. He's seen on the gas station CCTV. After buying the gas, he returns to the home, drops off the cans. Shortly after that, he takes Jennifer out to the car and drives her to the bank. Interestingly, he allows her to enter the bank alone whilst he remains in the car. She's seen here on the bank's CCTV at 12 minutes past nine. Whilst all this is happening, Joshua Komisarjewski has been left alone with the rest of the Pettit family. Between 7.27am and 9.14am, a number of photographs were taken using Joshua's phone. They showed Michaela tied to the bed in various states of undress and in different poses. In some of the photos, a man's genitals can be seen poking into frame from behind the camera. Joshua Komazarjewski would later admit to taking the photos, but he denied raping Michaela. A forensic examination told a different story. His semen was found inside her rectum. Meanwhile at the bank, Jennifer withdraws $15,000 from her account. She leans forward and informs the bank teller that two men are holding her family captive. As she's leaving with the money, the teller goes into a back room and calls the police. The caller says, we have a lady who is in our bank right now, who says that her husband and children are being held at their house. The people are in the car outside the bank. She's getting $15,000 to bring out to them, that if the police are told, they will kill the children and the husband. She says they are being very nice. They have their faces covered. She is petrified. They told her that they wouldn't hurt anybody if she got back there with the money. She believes them, I think. It's amazing how calm she was, but then again she could have been petrified, I don't know. Stephen Hayes drives Jennifer back to the house and takes her inside. Meanwhile the police dispatch officers to the petted house in unmarked vehicles and they set up a patrol around the perimeter with orders not to approach the property. Back inside the house, Jennifer is thrown down onto the living room floor. She has MS, so she's unable to put up much resistance here. Commissar Jeffsky shows Hayes the photos that he took of Michaela and tells him to do the same to Jennifer. Hayes then rapes Jennifer there on the living room floor. 
As he's doing so, he spots one of the unmarked police cars driving past the house and, in a fit of rage, he strangles Jennifer to death as he's raping her. Down in the basement, William Pettit can hear the commotion above him. Although he can't hear exactly what's happening, he can tell that they're doing something terrible to his wife. He shouts out for them to stop and hears one of the men shout back, Don't worry, it'll all be over in a minute. Upon hearing this, Dr. Pettit knows that he has to make a break for it. He begins forcing his body weight up and down against the support pole and eventually he breaks the zip ties and escapes. With his feet tied together and suffering from severe blood loss, he somehow manages to crawl up the steps and out of the bulkhead door, then hop across his driveway to his neighbour's house. His injuries are so severe that when his neighbours find him, they don't recognise him at first. Inside the Pettit house, the intruders notice that William has escaped. Knowing that the police have surrounded the property, they hastily put the final part of their new plan into action. Stephen Hayes takes one of those cans of gasoline and douses the ground floor, including Jennifer's body. At the same time, Joshua Komazarjewski goes upstairs with the other can and pours it over the two girls who are still tied alive to their beds. He makes sure to leave a trail of gasoline leading from the beds out into the hallway. When they're finished, the two men run out the house. As they're leaving, one of them lights a match and throws it onto the ground, igniting the fuel. When later questioned, each man blamed the other for the lighting of the fire. Upon exiting the house, Hayes and Komazarjewski stole the Pettit family car and sped down the driveway. At this point, they crash into a waiting police car. They manage to drive on a short distance before being stopped by a police roadblock. At this point, they're arrested. Records show that at around this time, the police also call for an ambulance for Dr. Pettit and they call the fire department because flames are now engulfing the upper floor of the house. Sadly, the speed at which the fire spread made it impossible to enter the house. The two girls tied to the beds endure a horrific death. The crime scene photographs give us some idea of what they went through. This picture is of Michaela's bed. As you can see, the fire didn't touch most of her room, just the bed itself and the area where Komazarjewski had made a trail of gasoline. Officially, Michaela died of smoke inhalation, but it seems like she burned while she was still alive. Her body was found with the arms still tied to the bed, but the legs and half her body were hanging over the side. Presumably the flames engulfed her while she was still alive, burned through the ropes on her feet and she made a desperate attempt to get off the bed and away from the flames. Hayley Pettit also died of smoke inhalation, although her corpse tells a harrowing tale of her final moments. As you can see from the photo of her bed, it too was consumed by the fire, but Hayley's body wasn't found on the bed. It was found face down in the hallway outside the room. Although she died face down, most of the burns were on the front of her body. What likely happened was, she was being cooked alive as she was tied face up on the bed. Then the fire burnt through her restraints enough that she was able to escape, but by that point her injuries are so bad that she only manages to make a few steps out of her room before dying on the floor. three unimaginably terrible deaths and one survivor, William Pettit, who now has to live the rest of his life knowing what happened to his family. Having to go through those court cases, listening to all the details, I don't know how a man lives with those kinds of thoughts in his head. It's testament to his mental strength that he managed to move on with his life. I'm not sure if I would be able to do the same. As for Hayes and Komazarjewski, they were both given death sentences for their crimes, but in August of 2015, the state abolished the death penalty, so their sentences were changed to life imprisonment. Stephen Hayes did a few interviews on the 15 Minutes With podcast. I'll put a link to them in the description so you can give it a listen, but I've got to say, I'm not convinced by his apology. It sounds empty and superficial, as do his wheedling excuses and attempts to minimise his actions and pass the blame on to Komazarjewski. It's pathetic to hear, but still an interesting listen. 
Anyway, that's the end of the video. Yet another horrific story to spoil your day. So thanks again to John Paul George for suggesting it. Huge thanks also to all the other patrons. It's much appreciated. Some people have been asking me to put in higher tiers on my Patreon, but I don't think at the rate that I put out videos it's worth putting in a tier that's higher than £2, $2.50 a month. I see Patreon as sort of a tip jar. It helps to cover any videos to get demonetized like this one probably will, so I don't have to worry about censoring myself. There's a chance that one day my channel will get fully demonetized, so I'll probably think of some higher tiers and better rewards when that happens. I just wanted to say that because people have been asking. If you found the video interesting, let me know in the comments. Here's some more videos you might enjoy too. Until next time, goodbye.